on this Wednesday night, weathering extreme storms. Toronto is resilient. The challenge for Canada's largest city to adapt to climate change. Former Republican rivals hop on the Trump train. Donald Trump has my strong endorsement. Can he really stick to his word and unify Americans? Sit, wait, and obey the border rules. <coughs> what pet owners now have to do before bringing their dogs to the U.S. Plus, a place ready for rest, relaxation, and rowdiness. Can we design this cardinal bed for free or whole people, jump on that. Inside the Athletes' Village at the Paris Olympics. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. It is back to business in Toronto after a record-breaking storm yesterday that dumped so much rain, parts of that city came to a standstill. Well, the water has now receded. Traffic is flowing again on major highways. Power has been mostly restored to the thousands of customers who lost it, but some roads are still closed. Many homeowners are mopping up and assessing the damage. The torrential downpour is a wake-up call about the weaknesses of Toronto's aging infrastructure. Eric Sorensen has our top story on whether the city can handle another major onslaught. Nearly 100 millimeters, four inches of rain in less than four hours. Toronto was not designed to handle that much water. A day later, a remarkable recovery. Major roads that flooded were reopened. Power was mostly restored, the subway was working, and traffic, while always kind of slow, was back to normal. Toronto is resilient. But the flood damage bill for homeowners and for governments is still to come and will keep rising as Toronto adapts to extreme summer weather. We must take action to build the resiliency uh, of our city. New regulations and new infrastructure are designed to protect against the kind of flooding that happened this week. But old infrastructure can't be replaced overnight and torrential storms are coming more often. At one time, this deluge would have been deemed a once in a century event. Toronto, with decades old and underground infrastructure, has seen three such storms in 11 years. The challenge is we're improving our systems and the old infrastructure at the same time these events continue to happen. I mean, I don't even know why we talk about 100-year storms anymore because that definition seems to have flown right out the window. A $1.4 billion project that will reroute the mouth of the Don River will provide expanded flood protection starting in a few months. But even as Ottawa has funded billions in infrastructure, it's clear that cities like Toronto will need more help. We're going to continue to be there uh, to make sure that people are safe. For the Prime Minister, Toronto is also political real estate that Liberals must shore up. They hope that funding that confronts the reality of climate change provides a contrast with the federal Conservatives. We need to continue to step up on our fight against climate change. We also need to continue to be making investments in resilient infrastructure that can handle uh, what the future is holding. City officials say they can't avert all the disruptions that come from major storms, but add that Toronto is better prepared now than in the past and will steadily adapt because it has to. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Now to Milwaukee, where the newly chosen vice presidential nominee for the Republicans, J.D. Vance, will take to the stage in a primetime speech. It's clear that he and the delegates to the Republican convention are firmly behind former President Trump. But can they win over the country? A Reuters Ipsos poll shows Donald Trump has a marginal lead among registered voters in the U.S., suggesting the attempt on the former president's life has not sparked a major shift in sentiment. And 80 percent of those polled agreed with the statement the country is spiraling out of control. Jackson Prosco is at the Republican convention. Jackson. Well, Donna, it's against that backdrop that former President Donald Trump is set to deliver his acceptance speech tomorrow, a speech he says he rewrote in the theme of unity shortly after that failed assassination attempt on Saturday. Donald Trump toured the stage where he hopes to recast his image promising to deliver a speech that will bring Americans together. Donald Trump got shot and he toned down the temperature. That's what a real leader does. Days after his near miss with an assassin's bullet. Donald Trump has my strong endorsement, period. Trump's Republican rivals have unified behind him. America cannot afford four more years of a weekend at Bernie's presidency. But there's little sign of the party moving to expand its reach to undecided voters. 
The convention has featured angry partisanship. They tried to bankrupt them. And conspiratorial claims about the shooting. And then last weekend they tried to kill him. And there he is over there alive and well. I'm Jackson Perosco with Global News. We asked Republicans whether anything has really changed. Has there been a tone shift here? But well, first off, I think that's what the American public would like. They'd like us to come together and focus on the problems of the country and solve them. Glad it's going smoothly and the message of unity has been strong. If the party is eyeing a long-term pivot and a lowering of the political temperature, that message will have to come from the top. And Trump will have to find the strength to stick with it for the next 110 days. If he starts saying things in his rallies that are what he was saying before Saturday, I think then the goodwill will gradually wash away. After all, November is a really long time from now. In this moment, he's riding a high in the polls, better positioned than ever to return to the White House, especially if Americans believe he is now a changed man. Jackson, another Democrat is calling on President Biden to pass the torch and not run against Trump in November. This time it's Adam Schiff, a congressman from California. What is he saying? Donna, Adam Schiff is the highest ranking Democrat to now call on Biden to step aside and is essentially saying that the risks to democracy are too great for him to remain in the race. It comes as two thirds of Democrats also agree that it's time for Biden to step aside. And all of this, of course, is against the backdrop of the Republican convention. And essentially, if this keeps up on the Democratic side, Republicans will be able to nominate their candidates and then probably not have to say much, given all the infighting going on with Democrats right now. All right, Jackson Prosco in Milwaukee. Thanks. Late today, the White House said President Biden has tested positive for COVID. He has canceled a campaign event tonight in Nevada and is going back to Delaware to self-isolate. But the White House says he will carry out his duties while he's there. Some top Republicans are calling on the head of the Secret Service, Kimberly Cheadle, to resign over security lapses in the lead up to the assassination attempt on Trump. The motive of the gunman is still not known, but a source tells NBC News local law enforcement saw 20 year old Thomas Crooks with a rangefinder before the rally on Saturday. It's used to measure shooting distances. And sources tell NBC he was identified as a suspicious person 62 minutes before he opened fire, but the Secret Service lost sight of him. After a surprise move by the U.S. to tighten the rules on bringing dogs into the country, some of the new measures have already been relaxed. But the federal health minister believes Canada should be exempt entirely. He calls the rules intended to control the spread of rabies unnecessary and poorly thought out. Ithu Garcha explains what it all means for your pet. Long-haul truck driver Devi Gershbane calls it a significant change and it will affect anyone traveling to the U.S. with their pets. Starting August 1st, dogs entering the country will be mandated to be at least six months old, have a microchip, have valid veterinary records and a CDC dog import form submitted two to ten days in advance. A lot of people have dogs as companions in their truck. They're also protection dogs, but they're also service animals. With more than 35 years experience on the job, Gershbane travels into the U.S. up to eight times a month with Radar and Ever, both companion and show dogs. Dog show people, we have what's called baby puppy, which is three months to six months. Those people are no longer allowed to take those puppies down to show. She fears employers may start banning dogs if drivers face paperwork issues at the border. Having a dog on the road with you is a privilege, it's not a right. The new regulations in the U.S. aimed at protecting against rabies are taking many, even the federal health minister, by surprise. Surprised and blindsided. I'm quite concerned, if I'm honest. Mark Holland is pushing for an exemption for Canada, noting initial discussions indicate a grace period may be granted, along with a reduction to the paperwork requirements. Roughly 400,000 Canadians a day uh, go to the U.S., and when you think about the fact that around 20% of them have a dog, that's a big number of dogs. Here at BC's Pacific Highway border crossing, drivers are bracing for the impact of the new pet travel regulations, which could disrupt their usual routines and add extra hurdles to their trips. Well, yeah, it could be a pain. I wanted to come with, uh, with the dog, you know, frequently, but again, now it's not going to be possible, at least for now. Back in Manitoba. 
Devi says many other truckers travel with their dogs, and if they're forced to leave their pets at home, it could disrupt the flow of goods, a risk she says is much greater than that of the spread of rabies from dogs in Canada. Neetu Garcha, Global News, Surrey, B.C. B.C. Premier David Eby says his province supports Newfoundland and Labrador's court challenge of federal equalization payments. The system is clearly broken, and the federal government made an explicit decision not to sit down and to renegotiate the formula with premiers. We're not saying, by the way, that we have the solution right now. We're asking uh, for the courts to evaluate the fairness of it. At the end of their annual meeting, all the premiers called for a more fair and equitable relationship with Ottawa. Newfoundland and Labrador launched a lawsuit against the federal government earlier this year, arguing the province is being cut out of what could be billions of dollars in the long term. The private business dealings of a federal cabinet minister were the focus of a parliamentary probe today. A Global News investigation raised questions about whether Liberal MP Randy Boissonneau had continued to be actively engaged in a company he used to help run after he got elected. That would violate ethics rules. His former business partner was asked today about multiple text messages discussing a business deal with someone named Randy. His defense? It was a problem with autocorrect. Krista Hesse reports. With regards to the infamous text message featured by a global news story, this was an unfortunate autocorrect suggesting it was Randy. This is Stephen Anderson, an Edmonton man who used to be business partners with Randy Boissonneau, Canada's employment minister. Together, they owned a medical supply business called Global Health Imports until about two weeks ago when Boissonneau disposed of his shares. Anderson's here testifying before the Ethics Committee because text messages from 2022 show him talking about a business deal with someone named Randy. So another text message from you says, sorry, I'm very confused. I updated Randy, Shauna, Felix, and our CFO. Over the course of three days, Anderson mentions Randy several times in text messages obtained by Global News. You expect us to believe that you ought to correct it eight times without correcting yourself, even once? That is the truth, yes. I don't think I want to get into asking you what you think an autocorrect is, but I can tell you that this isn't that. Th th this isn't that. It was Randy Boissonneau. Randy Boissonneau was not involved with our operation or in any business relation after September of 2021. Well, you, you your story doesn't add up. Anderson admitted to lying to Global News about who the Randy in the text was, and he refused to say who it is. But he maintains it is not Boissonneau. No and the Ethics Commissioner last month said his office won't be investigating the minister. In a statement, Randy Boissonneau said he was deeply troubled and disappointed by Anderson's testimony and reiterated that he has had no involvement in the company since he was re-elected in 2021. The committee passed a motion calling Boissonneau to testify again in the fall. Donna? All right, Krista Hesse in Toronto, thanks. Six people found dead in a luxury hotel in Thailand. Coming up, what investigators believe killed them. Britain's newly elected Labour government is vowing to end years of divisive politics. King Charles delivered the speech from the throne at the state opening of Parliament today. At the heart of Prime Minister Keir Starmer's legislative agenda, stabilizing the UK's finances and spurring economic growth. Health, migration and counter-terrorism are also high on the list. Crystal Gamancing reports on the new government's plans. Words of national renewal set against ancient traditions. The King commands this honourable house. Keir Starmer says under Labour, conversion therapy will be banned after years of demands to protect the LGBTQ2 community. The Prime Minister also promises to strengthen relations with the European Union and invest in clean energy by creating a state-owned energy company. Pages of priorities that fall to the sovereign to share in the king's speech. Royal pageantry on full display, but this speech is also historic. The last time a monarch gave a speech from the throne for a new Labour government was back in 1997, and it was delivered by King Charles' mother, Queen Elizabeth II. In a packed House of Lords, the king spoke noting domestic policies 
and critical foreign affairs. My government will play its part in trying to secure long-term peace and security in the Middle East. It is committed to a two-state solution with a safe and secure Israel alongside a viable and sovereign Palestinian state. Work that now falls to members of parliament. This is a new era. We are turning the page. We're turning politics to service. An era of steady, calm progress, says the Prime Minister. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. Police in Thailand say cyanide poisoning was likely the cause of the deaths of six people who were found in a room in a luxury Bangkok hotel. The cyanide was found on drinking glasses and a teapot in the room at the Grand Hyatt Hotel. A group had ordered food and English tea to their room. The six victims were Vietnamese, two had American citizenship. Police say the suspected killer is among the dead. Based on interviews with relatives, it's believed the deaths could be related to a business dispute between some of the victims. And 14 high school students in Japan have been hospitalized after eating spicy potato chips. They were taken to hospital with severe mouth and stomach pain. The chips are made with ghost peppers. They're one of the hottest chili peppers in the world, and the company does warn people under 18 not to eat them. Hiring spree ahead why Canada's civil service has exploded in size over the past nine years. The federal government is a massive employer and keeps getting bigger. More than 10,000 employees were added to Canada's civil service last year, pushing the size to record levels. New data from the Treasury Board shows the federal government's payroll, not including the armed forces or the RCMP, now has more than 367,000 people. That's an increase of 43% over the nine years the Trudeau government has been in office. And it's double Canada's population growth rate during that time. David Aiken breaks down where the biggest growth is happening. David. Well, Donna, the new data shows that only about 43% of the entire civil service works here in the national capital region, and that ratio has remained pretty much unchanged since the Harper Conservatives were in power nine years ago. But what has changed under the Trudeau Liberals is the number of civil servants. During each of the last five years Stephen Harper was in office, the civil service got smaller. But since Justin Trudeau took office, there's been more and more civil servants every year. If you're asking, is it a good or bad thing that government is more ambitious? I think it's a good thing. But it has to be measured against results. Ottawa has been hiring all over the country, especially in two Atlantic provinces. New Brunswick and Newfoundland and Labrador each have 62% more federal civil servants now than they did during Harper's last year in office. The last Conservative government gutted federal jobs in Newfoundland and Labrador. Newfoundland's political minister Seamus O'Regan said in a statement, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are as capable as any Canadian to work for the government of Canada. I'm glad we reversed the cuts. The opposition says all those hires are not making a difference to Canadians. You can't get anyone on the phone at CRA. Incredible delays just to get a passport. And the federal government is not delivering any services that it wasn't del delivering before. At the CRA, the Canada Revenue Agency, there are nearly 20,000 more tax collectors now than in 2015. That's an increase of 48%. At Employment and Social Development Canada, which includes Passport Canada offices, there's 17,000 more workers, an increase of 80%. And at Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, there's an extra 6,700 workers, more than a 105% increase during the Trudeau years. Now, a government spokesman says the size of the federal workforce is adjusted to align with the mandates of each minister. But there was a promise in the last budget to reduce the size of the civil service by about 5,000 jobs over the next four years through attrition. Donna. David Aiken in Gatineau, Quebec, thanks. The nominees for television's top honor were announced today and several Canadians have made the list. Put your seatbelt on. Seatbelt. People's safety. We're stealing a f***ing chip truck. Toronto's DeFerro won a tie, has his first Emmy nomination for Best Lead in a Comedy Series. He appears in Reservation Dogs. It's a series about Indigenous teenagers in rural Oklahoma. Canadian legend Martin Short is also nominated for that same award for his part in Only Murders in the Building. And Ryan Gosling's Saturday Night Live hosting gig earned him a nomination. 
Your shirt says original birth. Yeah, it's a printing mistake. Collector's item. And the FX series The Bear set a record for most nominations for a comedy series. The show about a family sandwich shop turned fine dining establishment earned 23 nominations. No AC, no problem. Next, how the Paris Athletes Village will keep Olympians and Paralympians cool. This is the mayor of Paris keeping her promise. She went for a swim in the Seine today to showcase it's clean enough to swim in. Organizers have invested about $1.5 billion to prepare the river for events at the Olympics and Paralympics. But yesterday's E. coli levels registered just under what the World Triathlon Federation has determined is safe for competition. The Seine was last used for swimming events at the first Paris Olympics in 1900. The city also built the first ever Olympic Village when it hosted for a second time in 1924. That was a primitive design, but today athletes will arrive to a huge operation featuring some of the latest innovations to help them reach peak performance. Redmond Shannon gives us a look. Sleep is one of the most important aspects of an athlete's preparation. Olympic and Paralympic organizers say the summer heat shouldn't keep them awake in Paris, despite a lack of air conditioning in rooms as standard. All apartments have an underfloor cooling system that can reduce the temperature of an external temperature from 6 to 10 degrees. Many teams, including Canada, are paying for extra AC units to make sure stars stay cool. These cardboard beds were first rolled out at the Tokyo Games. The designer is eager to reassure athletes that the frames are up to just about anything. We designed this cardboard bed for three or four people jump on that. Because after he got the medal, people become very happy. The beds will be customised for each of the around 14,000 competitors at the Olympics and Paralympics. Staff also hope that quieter electric vehicles like these will help make the village more tranquil, as long as your room isn't near the bar. Safety is, of course, more important than any night's sleep. Not every team wants to reveal where its athletes are staying. We do actually keep uh, the position of all delegations confidential. This is for safety and security reason. Um, of course, if some, some people are uh, not willing to stay next to each other, we don't put them next to each other. Paris 2024 claims 40% of the 2,700 apartments will become social housing after the Games. Similar promises have been made by other host cities in the past, but they haven't always been kept. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Vancouverites were treated to a soaring spectacle last night. That is the Italian Air Force aerobatic team. They roared over the city, leaving a patriotic trail of white, red, and green. And keep your eyes on the sky. They're heading over the prairies over the next five days. It's part of a summer tour through the U.S. and Canada to showcase the skills of the Italian Air Force. That is Global National for this Wednesday. Thanks for watching and hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.